us live now. I'm just waiting on it, catching up on the actual stream itself. Yeah, there we go. That's us. And we're live. All I have to make sure is that I mute. I don't want that coming back at me. <laughs> we're live. Yes, we are. But anyway, uh, you, you seemed uh, especially pissed off by everything that happened to me. I think more so than me. I'll tell, I'll tell you, well, no, not more so, but the day it was, it, I'm writing this, the day that you got your verdict, and yeah. was it the final verdict? That was a day that I was actually at one of these um, anti-Semitism conferences in Jerusalem. It was right. a two-day, uh, it's like, it's depressing, because all they wanted to talk about was, Right wing, right wing, Nazis, Nazis, neo Nazis, right wing, white supremacists, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. And I've been studying Islam for 15 years, and there was like 30 minutes where someone said, there might be this Islam thing. And we're sitting in Israel with rockets pointed at us from Hezbollah in the north, Hamas in the west. I'm sitting in a bomb shelter. And, I put, and believe me, my bomb shelter is not to protect me from rockets from neo-Nazis in Arkansas. It's only about <laughs> rockets from, from Islam. And, yeah. and, so, and at the same time as I'm at this conference, I'm hearing that you've been convicted for this ridiculous, obvious joke. Yeah. I've, I've, the thing I've heard as well is that a lot of people in the Jewish community were uh, really, really pissed off at the fact that the man who shall uh, remain nameless, who was appointed as the voice of authority representing all Jews around the world who uh, spoke at my trial, um, he caught a hell of a lot of shit. And it's a case of like, uh, apparently Jews for Europe were like, oh, you know, we're, we're over here getting our kosher stores and burned down and all this type of stuff. We're getting our... Yamaka's slapped off her head as we walked down the street and uh, you are kicking up a fuss over a dog. And it's like, this this is the type of stuff that, you know, might make people not like us so much. <laughs> so anyway, he got a lot of shit. He got well, a lot of shit for doing that. The thing we, we're always sort of, I, I hate banging on about anti-Semitism. Okay, firstly, I generally call it Jew hatred. That raises the bar, okay? Because like, if I'm going to cause accuse somebody of being a Jew hater. I really have to think about it. Anti-Semitism is a crap term invented by somebody who hated Jews to disguise his Jew hatred. So right. we'll move. So Jew hatred. So you did a joke. And, I, and when I first became aware of the joke, and what, what was this? I don't know, two, a year and a half, two years ago, I showed it to my, I think it was about 10 or 11 year old. Because I wanted to see, because he's like steeped in internet culture. He, <laughs> he's, a, he's a fledgling gamer. Yeah, I did. I mean, you know, and he speaks English, obviously. And um, so I showed it to my kid. And at the same time, I also showed him, I showed him two other things because I showed him Monty Python. Um, I showed him um, one of the Monty Python, the Monty Python sketch with the Nazis sitting around discussing which road was going to be the quickest way to get somewhere, A34 or the, and, yeah. and, and then I also showed him uh, John Cleese's goose stepping in the in Faulty Towers. Yeah, they're the famous one. Yeah. <laughs> and okay, I mean, you know your your pug joke. It's not it's not quite up there with those two. But no, I, I definitely I I don't compare to Monty Python or uh, Mel Brooks or anything like that in any aspect. Don't worry, I'm not I'm not holding myself up there with them. That they're a they're, they're, they're like God tier level of comedy. I'm exactly. Not, yeah, I'm definitely not there. <laughs> but this, but but I could see it was a joke. My kid could see it was meant as a joke. And and I'll tell you what's what bugs me. And and this is why I wanted to jump on a stream with you, is that what's actually really dangerous and is real Jew hatred today is falsely using this term Nazi. So I'm associated with Tommy Robinson socialist worker okay every time they write about him they call him the nazi tommy robinson every single time and all what it does is it means that an ideology because that's what it was it was an ideology that went and slaughtered millions of my people and millions of other people and resulted in this enormous world war that ideology is cheapened when you call a guy from luton a nazi <laughs> 
Yeah. He's not a Nazi. He is not about to create death camps or engage. Do you know? What? Actually, I'll keep talking. Do you know what the charge was at Nuremberg? The main, the biggest charge that the Nazis were, were put to. Okay, and it really it wasn't about the the Holocaust. It wasn't about the, the concentration camps or anything. It was waging aggressive wars of conquest. That was the number one crime they did. Right, I didn't, I didn't know that. I, yeah, I, thought, in it order, all, in, I thought it was all the Holocaust. I thought that's why they no, all. No, 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 no. It was the number one charge was that they committed the highest crime the international community could think of, which was not killing millions of people. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's been done, and that continues to be done. But waging aggressive wars of conquest, taking Poland, Czechoslovakia, all these other places in aggressive wars. That's a really big deal. Yeah. Yeah, it's like worldwide imperialism, pretty much. Because I, 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 think, I think that was his end game. He wanted, I don't know if he just wanted Europe, but I've got a feeling that even if he did get Europe, would it would he have stopped? A little bit of <laughs> Poland, a little bit of, yeah. I mean, a yeah. little bit of peace, a little peace of Poland. I mean, that was the point. And the thing is, this is what really makes me mad. And then, so, so then I went and actually looked at Socialist Worker. And unfortunately, they have been calling just about anything they don't like for the last 20 years a Nazi. Everything. I mean, it's like I watched your, your communism um, uh, comedy thing. And, <laughs> and <laughs> but, but this is the point. It's like, that was funny. You reading what you said was Mein Kampf, and it isn't Mein Kampf, and it's definitely Marx, who yeah. was... Yeah, he 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 was an anti-Semite. Yeah, he he did not like Jews. Like, because he yeah, I was, hated like, Jews. Oh, that, that, and then I'm told that he's he's a Jew, and that Marxism is therefore a Jewish idea because he was born a Jew. <laughs> it's like and, and that's, that's the thing. I don't see. See, when I went right, I've heard that everyone was saying to me, "Oh, Karl Marx has said some said some shit about the Jews," and I was like, "All right, okay, then I'll incorporate that into you know the comedy act." And then I googled it, and I was like, "This wasn't just no. this wasn't just one or two things." <laughs> like yeah. he said, he said a fucking lot about the Jews. He he really really was pissed off with being look. He was pissed off at this. He he was a rebe he was rebelling against a religion that he had been born into. It's a religion. It's a culture. It's more complicated than that. And and it's. Judaism is something, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm, I, I, should we explain? Do, nobody knows who the hell I am, should I say? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, let everybody know. And I'm not even looking at the comments, and I, I don't think I'm gonna, going to. Um, so I'm Brian of London, but I live in Israel. I, I moved here 10 years ago. I grew up in London, moved to Israel 10 years ago because I wanted to raise little Jewish kids. And honestly, I, I was scared of the way that, Britain was going, especially with Islam. Um, so I moved to Israel because this is the homeland of us Jews. This is this is this is our spot. And now nowadays I call myself an indigenous activist um, because that just pisses off the left. So indigenous rights activist. I think that's a good uh, a good social justice warrior moniker to to adopt. And they don't know how to deal with that because then they come, the Palestinians, they're indigenous. And say, well, you know, which part, which part of Arab Islamic culture is indigenous to Israel? And they kind of look at their feet and shuffle because like the name Arab, Arabia, Jew, Judea, you know, it's like, <laughs> who do you think's from around these parts? You've just passed off so many people. <laughs> oh, I know, but who the... <laughs> Who cares? Life is too short to care about that kind of stuff. I, it's like there are some truths that you have to, you know, what I'm up against here is that the entire, um, we, we came home. We have a home. This is why I'm so pissed off at Britain for, and most European countries for going down this kind of Europeanization, this this idea that if you get rid of the nation, you'll all have peace forever, and that, that the World War II was caused by uh, nations, nationalism. It wasn't. Hitler was not 
Hitler was, was, was trying to expand his nation. That was the point. It was an aggressive war of conquest. He was trying to conquer. And then what, what have you gone and done? You've gone and bloody signed up for the Fourth Reich, run by Germany and France, and, and called it the EU. Just uh, get out! Is the, the, e, the EU army as well. They now want an army. They're basically getting a united Europe. They want a massive army. And it's like, I'm just sort of like, where, where have we heard this before? <laughs> like, that's the thing is, it's, it's the thing that's different is, um, it seems like not to be so much, uh, you know, this isn't a very identity focused, you know, Nazism was very, 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 you know, ad- identity focused as far as Aryanism and all yeah. of that stuff went. You know, this one, kind of the same thing, but it's just not got that identity focused part of it. But one thing that they're definitely doing is they're trying to censor things and stifle Freedom, freedom of speech. Like we've seen it as well with Article Thirteen. Like, well, I got, I got my 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 Facebook account was was purged uh, this week. You know, in the great Tommy Robinson purge, because yeah. I was associated with Tommy, so I lost my Facebook account. And I, I honestly, I don't want the bloody thing back. I don't want to give. I don't want to give my work to Zuckerberg to make money off anymore. I'm done with that. I'm yeah. sick of it. Well, pe- um, people, are, people are migrating. To different places um i've had i've had quite a few people say you know you don't have a right to a platform you don't have this you don't have that but the problem is like this is an argument i was having earlier on today on twitter i've, I've been known to argue on twitter you may have noticed um but let's see how facebook and twitter they have a huge huge market share of the social infrastructure of online and it's basically Jack himself has even said that Twitter should be seen as, you know, the the ideological town square where oh, all, conversations, all conversations and ideas happen. But the problem except is except Sargon, except, except for Sargon and except, Milo, except, and except, <laughs> except for, only for ideas that we approve of. Whereas, oh no, you still have your right to free speech, but you don't get to do it in the town square where your ideas can be treated, you know, with the same, have the, you know, have the same effect as everybody else. You get to speak at some alleyway in the arse end of town <laughs> where no one hangs out. You know, and it's like, that, that's, it's just a very unfair way of doing things because see how if you put two ideas against each other in front of an audience, the strongest idea will win. Yeah, and that's but, what we see every time these guys post and we ratio them and, and you know, like Tom Watson's, this unbelievable email to Google telling them to to dump Tommy Robinson. That's but the answers to that were just brilliant. It's la- labor, like that. That's the reason I have such a huge problem with labor. It's like again, hashtag not all, not everyone <laughs> on labor is like this, right? But a lot of them are authoritarians that do want to censor people. I mean, we even had stand up to racism shutting down our events, and I'm there like, oh. Nazis alt-right and all this stuff. And this was me and Sargon, and it's like, we we want individual liberty. Like, I want a codified British constitution. I want us to have more rights. I want the government to be minimised to the lowest possible level. I don't want the government to have as much power as it does. How, how does that make me fascist? That's literally the opposite of what a fascist wants. Fascists want the state to be God. They want the I'll state. tell you, yeah. <laughs> I'm unusual here in Israel, even Nick. So, so a couple of months ago, the um, the Israeli press, uh, it's called the General Press Office. They organised uh, like a, a few day seminar for uh, Jewish journalists. So they had one actually three weeks earlier for Christian journalists, and they had one for Jewish journalists. And they kept the two separate, and I know why, because the Christian ones would be largely overwhelmingly pro-Israel and the Jewish ones would be annoying and skeptical because like they would be left wing. They would be like all the left wing Jewish journalists from around the world. And sure enough, there were a few like of my type who who flew in for this. But, uh, you know, within Israel, our press is left wing and outside of Israel in the diaspora, the Jews are generally left wing and it drives me crazy. So we, we have this um, we have this this event organized by the press office, and I have completely forgotten the point I was going to make. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, man. I do that all the time myself. So, but oh god, god I, ha- I had a I had a cogent point. What were you talking about? Um, I'm talking lady. about people getting banned from platforms and basically ideas not getting treated the same. You know, you get banished to an alleyway. Well, yeah. <laughs> 
so I managed finally. I I back in the Brexit days where I I I kept getting. I got invited a few times onto to. to we have like a little sort of mini startup news station called I24 News, which uh, it, sort of you get the odd video that burps itself out onto social media and gets noticed. But um, so I got invited on as the Brexit guy. I was always the pro Brexit one. Yeah. And uh, that stopped about a year after Brexit because my last, the last time I was in their studio, I said, I said that the EU was the combination of, uh, it had been created by former Nazis and former communists and was the extension of Ger the Germany by another. It was the <laughs> creation of a new German empire. And I never went back on. Anyway, I managed to get like time with one of, you know, I, I did my little stand up piece and they actually played it out again. But getting any kind of right wing pressure, oh, that was it. This is the point. So we, we're in the Knesset, in the parliament. And we get this, um, one of the top guys from Likud, which is the ruling party, it's Netanyahu's party. And we get told, there's like a room of 60 of us, we're going to get upgraded. Netanyahu is going to actually talk to us, 60 of us. And uh, while we're waiting, this guy's giving like a speech of how the, how the parliament operates. And he gets the thing and he says, we're such an efficient parliament that last year we passed 400 laws and his his criteria of success was how many more laws could they pass? And this is supposedly the right wing of Israeli politics. And I'm sitting there as a kind of libertarian tendency, uh, free speech extremist thinking, oh, God, you've got this all wrong. The point <laughs> is to just step back from the laws, pass fewer laws, cancel yeah. laws. <laughs> I, would like, I would like to see the government passing laws that, you know, protect rights. None of this, none of the ones that restrict rights, but they try and argue that it protects rights. Like, for example, people have a right to not be offended. No, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> that's not a right. That's not a right at all. Like, that is not all right. It is not. But I mean, even Americans, you know what? I read the Constitution. Um, yeah. Most of those amendments, they start Congress shall pass no law such. That's how they start. They're all, those rights are actually, the rights are inherent and God-given. And the, the American Constitution is this document that says government cannot do this. Government shouldn't do that. Government mustn't pass a law restricting this, that, or the other. I mean, yeah. but but I'll, I'll flip it. There's, there's actually a Jewish principle behind this. Judaism is built on responsibilities rather than rights, okay? The Ten Commandments are a, set of your responsibilities okay you don't have a right to life judaism nowhere in the bible does it say you're given a right to life within our tribe and this will send this will send the uh, the, yeah. the the woke guys mad but it's basically since you just said tribe tribe <laughs> within our tribe um if i observe the the my responsibility not to murder people Everybody else's right to life is assured. Same with not coveting, coveting their ox or their wife. You know, if I don't go after their wife and I don't go after their ox, their property and their wives are, uh, are protected. They don't have a right to the property, but I have a responsibility not to steal it. Yeah. And Judaism then deals with the edge cases of how, what happens when Jews butt up against people who don't follow our responsibilities. But that's why the Judaism is built on responsibilities rather than rights. America kind of, it takes Judaism through Christianity, but it then, it builds all of these inherent rights. And that's not really a Jewish thing. Um, it's just, a, it's a very in, diff, different philosophical approach, arrives at the same point mostly. It sort of, it just seems like it's all amalg amalgamated into, <clears throat> this is a certain code of conduct where if you follow it, you know, everyone will be fine. You know, no one's getting hurt. You're not hurting anyone. You, you can also be reassured knowing that you won't be hurt as well. It's just unfortunate that lots of people don't care <laughs> about that. You know, there are going to be people that are going to try and steal your shit. There's going to be people that are going to try and assault you and kill you and all that type of stuff as well. And it's just... But that's And that's well, why we've got, we've got like really good... This is why I like Judaism. And th this is where Christianity made a bit of a boo-boo. Um, the commandment that we have is thou shalt not murder. And we've got a word for murder 
And the word for murder in Hebrew only applies to humans, okay? We have a completely different word for killing, as in killing humans and killing animals. Those words are different. So the word murder, so the trouble was when the early versions of the Bible were, were translated, like the King James Bible, it still says, thou shall not kill. This is rubbish. This is wrong. And from there, Christianity has to go into a whole big complicated series of, of you know, theological nonsense to justify war. We, we Jews have got no issue with this because we were told not to murder people, okay? If somebody's coming at me with a knife and I kill him with a gun, that is not a murder. I am killing him because he was trying to kill me. No problem at all. No restrictions. In fact, we've got another commandment somewhere else that's a bit that that basically says if someone's getting up to come and kill you, you go kill them first. That's you know, most people see that as reasonable these days. If yeah. somebody's violently coming at you, you get them. Uh, there's a there's a right to self defence. We don't we don't really have that here in the UK, by the way. I know so, it terrifies me. Oh, yeah. um, our our self defence laws are shit. It's a case of you know, there's been many instances where. You don't. You don't just need to weigh up. You know, see in America, if someone comes at you, you can just you can defend yourself. You can spring into action. You don't need to think about it. Whereas in Britain, even if if someone's running at you to punch you or something or hit you with a baseball bat or something, not only do you need to sort of act and think quickly to defend yourself, you also need to weigh up the options of is this worth me getting a criminal record? Should I maybe just sit here and take the beating because if I fight back, there's going to be a high chance that I'm going to be arrested. <laughs> that, 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 you know we've had i mean we've had you know especially with the, the the whole sort of security situation here i don't have a gun i'm not allowed to uh, have a gun because i never served in the army i got here too late uh, by the time i got here i was 39 and they didn't even send me a letter i was kind of pissed off like i you know i wouldn't have minded a couple of weeks of basic training and popping off a uh, an m16 for a bit that would have been fun but it's not as good as you think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basic, so, basic fucking murder. <laughs> but, sorry, sorry, continue. <laughs> Funnily enough, my uh, my sister in law was a uh, drill sergeant. Uh, she was a basic training instructor in the army, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I I'm not allowed to carry a gun here. It would it would be really hard for me. I'd have to go live somewhere really dangerous. And then I'd have to do all sorts of jump through all sorts. But but the people who carry guns and like when we've had times, I mean, it's kind of the tension's gone down a bit at the moment. But we had this sort of whole stabbing epidemic for a couple of years, about a I, year. I, I remember that actually, yeah. And actually, one of the things was that the, the you know the, the mayor of Jerusalem, he he actually apprehended what a terrorist himself. Um, he he pulled his sidearm and he and and he actually wrestled a guy to the ground didn't shoot him actually took him out and then he and he also put out a statement saying you know if you own a gun it is your responsibility to carry it now you must be carrying it do not leave it at home don't leave home without it um, yeah and and that kind of i i, I like it I, I don't know i mean one sees and the other thing is we don't have the concept of concealed carry here we have open carry you know if you've got it you wear it on your you know you you stuff it in the back of your jeans and that's where you know yeah. <laughs> you can be standing in the supermarket and the guy in front will will have it stuffed down the back of the jeans and i've got a friend who's a tour guide actually and she works um she lives and works over the line the green line the famous green line and so she spends most of her time over there and she's got a beautiful little um pink glock well, well it's like a glock but with like pink highlights <laughs> and she and then then she accessorizes it by making sure that her nail polish matches the the shade of a oh, glock <laughs> fucking man fucking woman <laughs> not self defense it's a fashion accessory <laughs> but, but this but you know i i i the idea that you're not allowed to defend yourselves or that you have to wait for the police to turn up. It's just ridiculous because they might be busy dealing with you, arresting you for your pug. Oh, that's, uh, the police are stretched so thin right now. And like, there's police officers that I've spoken to in private and they they cannot be bothered with this PC arresting people over over tweets. <laughs> they, they hate it. 
they hate it. Like one thing that's it's still going on, it's not as bad as it used to be, but central Scotland, especially in Glasgow, had an extremely bad knife crime epidemic. There was, you know, several stabbings happening every day, but that was all related to gang violence more yeah. than anything, just a common trend in Glasgow. Teenagers from a certain estate would go out, get drunk, go to another estate to fight the teenagers there, and they would all bring knives. And it was it ended up getting to the point where simply having a knife on you or any kind of bladed weapon, it was six months automatic sentence. No ifs, no buts. If you had a knife on you, you got six months in jail. And then what happened was thousands of people went to jail, and it was a case that <laughs> became so overcrowded that these guys they were getting sentenced to six months, but then they were getting like released after a month. Just because they, they, they couldn't keep up with it, but you, but it worked in a way. But see the amount of tax money that went into it. But the thing is, like stop and search powers as well. Um, in certain areas, like we've got a place where laws change depending on the city you're in. Like for example, in Edinburgh, you're mm -hmm. allowed to drink in the street. In Glasgow, you're not allowed. You'll get you'll get an on the spot fine of, I think it's went up to eighty pounds for, for, for just having an open can having an open can of beer in a your special hand. brew or tenants right yeah usually <laughs> <laughs> that's one as well see i i do remember england i i, I know <laughs> uh the the winos on the street corner <laughs> that fair change yeah yeah it's a common staple here <laughs> yeah I, I i spent some time do you know what i i um i spent some time bizarrely enough so I got told I would be going to Edinburgh for uh, like six weeks in one summer, but it turned out it wasn't Edinburgh. It was Grangemouth. And I was staying. <laughs> <laughs> I just get that confused. <laughs> well, because I was actually, I was working at the BP refinery in Grangemouth, but instead of telling me I would be in Grangemouth, they told me I'd be in, in Edinburgh. And it sounded, it sounded pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and Grangemouth most definitely is not pretty. <laughs> um, sorry to Grange Mouth, but yeah, it's a it's a giant industrial petrochemical plant <laughs> on a scale I had never seen before. It, it was basically Blade Runner, as far as I concerned. That's what it looked like. So not exactly a tourist hotspot with lots of culture or anything like that. <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh, yeah, I, I tell you, I've got to come back and tour Scotland. I'm, I'm I, I've hardly been back to the UK, and in fact, you know what? When, when Martin Selner, Lauren Southern, and Brittany Pettibone all got banned, I yeah. started to wonder if I'm on a list. I I don't know. Can they ban a British citizen from coming home? Well, Unless, uh, you know, fighting for ISIS. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, well, so one thing that we noticed as well is I think if you've got any kind of a connection to Tommy Robinson or even us, uh, when we... Me and Sargon were doing an event in Scarborough. This was the one that gets shut down by uh, threats to the venue by stand up to racism. And uh, we we'd already had a uh, like we'd already arranged that there was people coming for Canada, America, Israel. We had people coming for everywhere. I felt I felt especially sorry for the guys coming from uh, Israel because uh, they'd booked their flights, they booked their hotels. By the time the event got cancelled, it was like past the refund date. Oh no! And they had to go to Scarborough. Yeah, they had to go to Scabra for an event that they could no longer attend. But we decided we're all, we're all going to go there anyway. We're all going to meet up. And basically, we had people coming from Israel <laughs> coming all the way to Scabra. What time of the year? Oh, this was, it was in the summer, so it was late. Oh, okay. Yeah. I did eight months working in Blackpool in the winter. I was right. flying from London every week, spending three nights in Blackpool. I was staying in a hotel that was abutting the... The zoo. There is a zoo in Blackpool. Yeah. Okay. So this 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 I'll tell you. So after we were there, and then we noticed that that if you had a room on one side of the hotel, there'd be this strange noise at like five thirty, six o'clock in the morning, and it was coming from the direction of the zoo. And I I can't even describe this sound. It was just like grunting, but times at times twelve and. <laughs> And it was just this bizarre noise. Anyway, after a few weeks of living in this hotel and, and waking up to this noise quite often, we went to the zoo and we asked them what the f this noise was. And the guy, we eventually got someone and he said, oh, that be the elephants. 
<laughs> Fuck's sake. I don't know if they were bullshitting us, but apparently it was elephants fucking every morning. <laughs> okay. That sounds like an amazing holiday, getting woken up every morning by elephants fucking... Yeah, well, not in Blackpool, it isn't in the winter, it's... Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if I can go. I, I, I suspect I can go back, but... But, like, when Tommy was here, this was because he visited me in 2016. That was when we, we did this famous, it was our first proper day of touring. And it was, it was November the 9th, 2016. It was the day Trump was elected. Oh. And we dro- we're driving up to the, the, the Golan Heights to have a look at, uh, to basically have a look at Syria and ISIS. Um, and on the way up there, we just see a field full of tanks. This, I've got to tell this story because this this made it into um, uh, Nick Griffin wrote this like little book yeah. about, uh, and it's all about how the alt right is not right because they like gays and they, you know it's like it just, and it's having a go at. There's one chunk that's having a go at Tommy Robinson because he is not far right, and yeah. Nick Griffin hates him because he's like friendly with gay people and friendly with black people and he's a race traitor and he's all the other things that the <laughs> real far right don't like and yeah. then you know socialist worker are calling him a nazi at a far right so nick griffin wrote about this so we were dri- we were driving up it was like seven of us in my wife's car that was how it how the whole trip was it was really sort of shoestring stuff and we see a bunch of tanks by the side of the road so i'm with a tour guide and she speaks better Hebrew than me, but we both, you know, and we just see tanks. And they're, they're not like tourist tanks. These are real tanks just on deployment, just bored because, you know, they're just waiting for something to yeah. go and do some exercise. So we drive off the road in my four by four, bouncing over the big ruts that the tanks lead, leave. And we drive, we don't drive right up to the tanks. We stop about 100 meters away. My friend goes off and finds the commander and says, do you mind if we just, you know, take some tourist snaps? And they're all just sitting on their tanks with their, you know, M16 at their feet, bored. You know, this is what tank crews do during (laughs) training exercises. So we just walk up and we just start taking snaps. Uh, And, you know, Tommy jumps up on one of the tanks because I tell him to in his shit shorts and his flip flops. And then there's like an M16 um just lying on the tank so i told him pick it up so he holds this thing and he doesn't like you know hold it he's like gingerly and because i don't think he's ever held a gun before i, I think i've seen this picture when you've he's seen like, this I, picture i've seen it yeah i've seen that so, one so we take this picture and i there are certain rules of what you can I, listen it's not a matter of censorship i'm not in the army i'm not not in mossad i'm not in any of the but i know one of the things we don't do is you don't take like a wide shot that shows where the tanks are that's yeah. just like rude okay yeah so every shot that i took was a you know one tank you can't see how many tanks there are in the field you don't know where the field is you just see a tank so i take the one shot and um i said and i I said to Tommy, okay, we can, we can put this out. So we tweet this. Sure enough, it gets picked up by the Evening Standard. And it gets picked up by the Muslim Public Affairs Committee or so one of these bastards, and they write a press release. And that what they say is that Tommy Robinson, the dangerous radical, has gone to fight with the Israeli Defense Forces in occupied Syria. Because we were actually standing in technically i guess the golan heights that we'd won from syria in 1967 so you know syria was a long way up a massive hill and over a rise and down the other side we were we were 30 kilometers from syria but technically (laughs) and and so these guys write this press release and then and then the evening standard of course takes the press release copies it word for word and puts Tommy on the front cover of the Evening Standard in his shit shorts and his flip flops, holding an M16, <laughs> <laughs> making out that he's like the equivalent of these guys going off and beheading people in ISIS. You cannot make this stuff up. He's, dre- he's dressed like the stereotypical Englishman in Benidorm, and apparently that means he's yes. battle. <laughs> exactly. And then he's like, he's, he's like dressed for battle, shit shorts, flip flops, M16, not even holding it proper. <laughs> I'm my tactical flip flops. <laughs> and what Nick Griffin then writes in his little sort of pseudo book thing is that I must be 
heavily connected with the Mossad and with the defense forces in order to get into a closed military zone. And I, and I swear to you, anybody could drive into that field. Anybody could walk up to those tanks. And I did, the only thing I did do, which was just a courtesy because I know the people, I did ask permission. Before I tweeted that, I sent it to, um, he, was a, he was a British guy at the time who was the head of the uh, IDF spokesperson's office. And I only know him because I meet him at various events that go on here. And I knew him. And so I, tw- I sent this, this picture to him and I said, do you mind if we do this? And his exact, word, his exact answer was, I think we will survive, as in the IDF will survive yeah. you tweeting a picture of Tommy on a tank. But, you know, and then we, we went up to the top of the Golan Heights. And while we're there, we were, so we're looking out down into Syria. There's a UN observation point up at this place. It's a it's a famous lookout point, and it's got a coffee place called uh, I wonder if I can explain. It's called Kofi Coffee Anan, and Anan is a cloud in Hebrew, and it sounds like Kofi Anan, the previous UN head. Yeah. So it's coffee in the clouds, but it also is the head of the UN. And there's a UN Syria observation force up there because they used to be in Syria, but it got too dangerous and we evacuated them. And now they spend all day with binoculars, like bankers hours, you know, 10 yeah. till four, staring at Syria with binoculars, watching little puffs of smoke as the Syrians kill each other. And they've been <laughs> up there for years. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Having a pizza at lunchtime and a nice coffee. Um, and you're, and you're wanting to invite me here. <laughs> so. the point, but this is the point. It's, it's, it's this bizarre. It's this bizarre. And I tell you what, though, that day we were up there. We, we went and we were at another lookout point just up there. And a mortar landed about a mile and a half from us. And I didn't really tell the guys. I mean, we heard it and I heard it and I knew exactly what it was. And then we, we were listening to the radio in Hebrew and yeah. You know, there had been a mortar strike, but it had been headed for an area where there was no one in it. So they hadn't rung the alarms or anything. <laughs> and then we, like, destroyed the mortar equipment that sent it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, man. See, see one of the accounts that I follow? I don't retweet any of the stuff, but the guy is, a, whoever runs it, the guy's a professional shit poster. Have you seen the, the Mossad, the real Mossad account on Twitter? I'm up. I might, I might have seen it. Yes, uh, <laughs> I know so it quite well. He's tremendous, actually. He posts some fucking spicy shit. <laughs> man, like I'm sitting there, like I made a joke where it was like merch, and it was like, uh, I, I, I think I tweeted out once where he had a he had a mug, and I had Jeremy Corbyn's face on it, with like the Star of David behind him, and I tweeted at it going. Like, I really, really want to order one of those, but uh, I'm kind of worried about handing over my address to you guys. And then <laughs> they replied to me going, we already know your address. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like half, half laughing, half rattled. I was kind of like, oh, <laughs> man. No, I, okay, I'll tell you a real story about the Mossad, okay? Um, this is the... This is the, what I think to be the only time I've had serious dealings with the Mossad. I went to an award ceremony for a semi-secret award at uh, a Mossad. There's, there is like a Mossad museum. It's not like on any of the maps. I didn't know it was there until I went to this award ceremony. It was a guy. I know him. He's, he's passed away, uh, but I still his wife is famous too. He, in the 1950s, he was a British, upper class British Jew, and he married a woman from Egypt, a Jewish woman who'd fled Egypt. And he was very, very wealthy, came from a hugely wealthy background and had moved to Geneva. And he wanted to do something to help the Jews. So he walked into the Jewish agency in Geneva and said, what can I do to help the Jews? And they said nothing. But then a few months later, they called him back and said, actually, we thought of something. Can you go to Morocco? Befriend po- can you go to Morocco? And he was like, he was very naive because he didn't quite understand who he was working for. Can you go to Morocco, be an upper class English twit, um, or not quite a twit, but an upper class English gentleman, go to church on Sundays, take your wife with you and become friendly with the king and all his courtiers. And this is what he did. And while he was doing that, they organized 
a holiday for under the, the Jews of Morocco were very, very, very poor, dirt poor, really toilet cleaning poor. They were the shit. Um, they were not rich Jews. Anyway, what they organized was like a holiday in in Switzerland for 600 or 700 Jewish children. And they got all the, the right passes and the king gave permission to this. And the, the kids all got taken to Switzerland. And from there, they went to Israel. And it could have gone bad. And, but what eventually happened was the king then said, ah, you can all go. And anybody who wanted it, any Jew that wanted, could leave Morocco. But that was a Mossad operation. It's called uh, Operation Mural. There's a film and a book and all this sort of stuff, you know, documentary stuff. But this guy eventually, about seven, eight years ago, got an award. And I went to the Mossad headquarters where the head of the Mossad and, you know, a bunch of people, you know, they gave this speech. But the, the one little bit I want to say is that in the speech that the head of the Mossad gave, he explained something which is not a secret, but it just people don't think of it this way. He said, for all of the lifetime of the Mossad, more than 50% of their resources have been dedicated to rescuing or planning to rescue Jews. So if, if Jews are living somewhere and it looks like it's going to go bad, Mossad have the plan to go and get them. That's what they do. Now, the killing of Nazis and the finding of Nazis and the killing Iranian nuclear scientists and, and all of that other stuff. Yeah. They do that too, but more than 50% of their resources over the entire course of their life and still to this day is all about having the plan on the... So if, if Turkey goes bad, we've got lots of Jews living in Turkey, there's a plan that they have to get all the Jews out of Turkey in 24 or 48 hours. That's what they do. That's, the, that's actually... And they're not as big as one thinks, but we like to think they are. <laughs> well, that's... I've re I've read a little bit about uh, Mossad's uh, little little vacations to uh, South America. <laughs> mm. <laughs> actually, there's a there's a film coming out about this thing in Egypt um, where they were running a diving school. That's coming out in the summer, I think. That they were running a diving school in Sinai in in Egyptian Sinai, and they were using that to get Jews out of Egypt. Yeah, it's like well, see 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 as far as like the the killing Nazis thing because this was yeah. I believe it was the it was the fifties and sixties. Yes, uh, a little bit into the seventies as well is where the most of that happened. And I'd, I'd I'd read I don't know I don't know how much of it is true, but I'd read that the agents and stuff like that they sent over there were people who had lost their parents in the Holocaust, right? And it was just like a case of like everyone's going, oh, that's disgraceful that they're doing that and everything. But I was just sort of like, if someone had killed my parents. And they came and says, we want you to hunt down and kill the people that killed your parents. Like, No brainer. Exactly. You're not going to say no to that. <laughs> like, fucking, I would, I would do it. If someone killed my parents and then the government went totally government sanctioned, you can go over there and murder, murder them. Well, yeah, like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, I would fucking do it. I, I, people, you know, this is what... I, uh, Judaism is very distinct from Christianity. We're, we're definitely, this is what, Judaism and Christianity are definitely joined, okay? Islam is, I think, an inversion. It's a, it's a total upside down to those two. But Christianity and Judaism are not the same. We have different rules. Um, and and to you, getting back to, to, to them persecuting you, the thing I like about Israel is, I think Israel itself not Jews outside in the diaspora, but we're done. I'm done with this victim crap. We are not victims here. We are strong. We are bloody strong. We are most definitely the strongest thing in the region. That's for sure. We've got, we've got, I think we, the British army's got more horses than tanks these days. And I think the Israeli army's got more tanks than Europe, except for Turkey. <laughs> I mean, if, if you take Turkey out of NATO, we've got more tanks than everybody. Um, and that's because we need them and we want them and we don't want to rely on anybody. And we're not this victim country. We just, that's it, done with the victim shit. I mean, this, this is it's sort of an unpopular thing to say. Look, we have, we have two Remembrance Days every year. One is for the Shoah, one is for the, for the 
the Holocaust. But we also have our day for remembering the fallen in wars and acts of terror. And the two are, uh, I think this year, they were exactly a week apart. Um, but I can tell you that the day for the fallen in wars and terror, we, the, the numbers are not even remotely comparable. It's, you know, it's, it's tens of thousands in wars and so on. Yeah. Um, but what we do is that day is, it's called Yom Azikaron, Memorial Day. And it, starts the night the jewish days start at nightfall so and the night the, the the sun goes down and there's a siren a two minute siren Woo! the whole country the whole country i mean i'm in a bomb shelter they have a sh uh, they have a siren they can ring across the entire country everyone can hear it everywhere yeah they ring that for two minutes and the cars stop on the roads okay and then the following morning at 11 o'clock in the morning, we ring the siren again. And then everybody who's lost someone, which is just about everybody, is standing in a cemetery uh, observing a two-minute silence again. And there's a, you know, then they shoot an honor guard and stuff like that. So this is a, like a really solemn day. But then at 8 o'clock in the evening, the day ends and we flip into Independence Day. And the kids are out in the streets and they're spraying foam foam sprays on all the cars and they're bashing each other with like Israeli flag ha inflatable hammers and there's fireworks and it's this flip we do this memorial day like 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 you know remembrance day like november the 11th but then we flip to independence day in a second and there's a linking there's a linkage between this is what we went through to get our country back this is, this is the sacrifices that people literally made to do that. And this is the independence we have because of it. And that defines Israel for me. And it's not a victim thing. It's like, we fought for it. We took it. I'm sorry about the King David Hotel. I'm sorry about USS Liberty. Shit happens in wars. It was a real bloody war. I mean, the, the point I like to get across is that for all the people who can tell me about the King David Hotel, where the British military was headquartered and some uh, Jewish terrorists, perhaps fighters blew it up. Um, and it was a military base at the time, not a sort of a, it was not a, a hotel. Yeah. These people who go on and on and on about that, they cannot tell me any other place in the entire British empire where natives blew up British soldiers. And trust me, it's a very, very long list. British soldiers were killed all over the empire by restless natives but the only one anybody ever comes up with from the american side they call it, it's the uss liberty and from the, the you know for us for the brits it's it's the king david hotel well yeah we did we fought a bloody war and then we had to fight the entire Arab world to get our place back and that what pisses me off is that britain there you are you're going to sign your country away and if you let it fall to islam you know Let's hope you don't have to wait a thousand years to get it back, because yeah. it's really shitty. Well, this see, this, this is the thing is like a lot of people are concerned about uh, Sharia law primarily. People think that obviously because uh, you know lots and lots of Muslims are coming here, Muslims are getting into power and stuff like that. Even though obviously in some areas it's different. You know, you have areas with higher Muslim populations and stuff like that. But I know a lot of Muslims and. One 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 of them that I especially I speak to, he obeys Sharia law, but I'm like, how do you feel about other people obeying Sharia law? And he's just that's their decision. Like if they if they don't. Well, that's that, that, this is that. the point. This is the crossover. It's like when yeah. does Islam become a political ideology? And as soon as it's a political ideology that has to expand and has to subjugate. And then this is the thing is that it's got this doctrine of dimitude. It's got this doctrine where once it conquers a territory, everybody has to follow its rules. Don't learn about Islam is one of the rules that they want dimmies to follow, wear different clothes, all of this other stuff. And But what I see happening in Europe and has happened is that your leaders have become dimmies. They have become subservient to Islam before conquest. They don't want to rock the boat. Now, from the sort of left-wing labor's perspective, I think it's just their lust for power and and yeah. their and their realization of where the bloody where the votes are 
you know, they they just know that there's certain areas where they can't they cannot gain power unless they get the Muslim vote. But it really it it's really depressing to see the leadership of these countries just give anything to get a quiet life life from the Muslims. Yeah, I think it's like there was a few things as well. Like uh, we rejected uh, Asia Bibi, um, the Christian yeah. woman who was being persecuted, and uh, because we thought, oh, it will cause uh, tensions back back here. And I was just kind of like, imagine like so basically what you what they were what they basically in an underhanded way said was that we know that these Muslims are going to get violent, so we're not going to try and save this woman. But that's been that, and that's been the story all the way through Tommy Robinson and the EDL days. It was like we can't let you exercise what should be your right to free assembly. That was his original point: was that these Muslims who were screaming abuse at the returning soldiers were yeah. protected by police cordon. That one arrest of his, I'm a kind of a bit of a Tommy Robinson expert, but. You know, one of his more useless arrests and prosecutions was the time he jumped over a barrier on uh, on November the 11th, seized a flag. And it, this was pre-ISIS. But yeah. what he was seizing was the black battle flag of jihad. He, see, he pulled it out of the guy's hand, pulled it, and whacked a policeman behind him. Ah, uh, right. And they took him. And, and he actually went to court on that. And the evidence that, uh, that, that got him off, actually, was that somebody had filmed their television. I, ITN had filmed the event, hmm. broadcast it once, and then lost the tape. But somebody had filmed the screen of the television. Right. And it clearly right. shows that, the, the, that he never deliberately hit a policeman. Yeah. That it was just as he pulled it back, it whacked the guy on the head on his helmet, you know. Ah, right. Now that's fair. But that, but that was the thing is, like, there's one person who I had to defend, even though we disagree on many things. You know, you obviously know of uh, Ali Dawa and Muhammad Hijab. Yes. Yeah. Well, basically, I had to defend Muhammad Hijab because everyone was saying that he punched a police officer when he didn't. Because see, if you watch the tape, like, uh, basically... Was that way? It was, it, it was like a... No, it was he, basically he, he had his hands up to defend himself, and see because yeah. he was he was getting punched from every angle. Someone punched him there, and see when they punched him there, his hand went forward, but his hand yeah. went open palmed into a police officer's face. And like Mohammed Dajab is a cage fighter; like he knows how to throw a punch. He's not going to go limp wristed and like squeeze his hand against a police officer's face. And like, but everyone's like, "Oh, he punched a police officer; he should be arrested." And I, I, I had to come out and go. What, look at look at the tape. He, he didn't. He didn't like basically someone literally punched his hand into the police officer's face. We didn't do that. You know, I don't. It's, I see the thing that's hard to see when there's people that you kind of don't like and you don't agree with them in a lot of things. See, because so much lying happens on all sides, you need to you need to call it out whenever well, you see. It. Yeah, I, I I try to stick with that stuff. I mean, it's like we're better than that. We don't need to do that. Some our, our, listen, our ideas are better. You know, Western civilization is a better way of running things than than communism or uh, you know. I I I mean, I look I look here. We're we're an imperfect state here in Israel, but we're trying. We're having babies, which is interesting. We're, you know, even the non-religious people are having babies here, which is indicative of a of an optimism that. I think Europe has, has lost. And so once you give up, and like, how bloody mad is it that half of Europe is led by people who don't have children? I was, I was about to say that. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, Merkel, Macron, none of them have kids and therefore they have no reason to care about the future. It's, it yeah. is, it's like unthinkable that you could have an Israeli leader without kids. I, th I think, you know, it just, it doesn't, I don't think any any people would think it too weird here. Yeah, like that, that's why that's why I, I feel I would have more trust in a leader who has kids because I'm like obviously you want the future to be as good as it possibly can be for your offspring. Like I plan on me and so are going to have kids as soon as we get married, and I want <laughs> I want the future to be bright for my kids. You know I don't want to have kids and have them growing up in an authoritarian shithole. 
you know, I would like this country to get its pride back and actually get back on track and yeah. give give people its fucking their fucking freedoms. Freedom, <laughs> freedoms. Get out of the way is is I mean this the whole speech regulation all of it. I mean we have it here too in Israel to a certain degree and and you know we we fight against it. I, I mean. We have little stuff like, uh, unfortunately, we have this like um, national identity card and a national identity number. Oh, it's yeah. so damn convenient though. It really is. It really is handy to have like everything keyed on one number. It's like you ring up your insurance company, you give them that one number, they know what you, you, you know, everything is like, but but then the libertarian side of me, because I do have a libertarian side, it's like, oh, this is so creepy. This is so creepy. Uh, they know everything. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a little bit perplexed that Israel's dishing out numbers to Jews. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know it's, it's it's not just Jews, of course. It's everyone, even that. Yeah. And 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 you know, we have twenty percent of our citizens are Arab, and they've got exactly the same ID card as I have. And then the Arabs who are living in the territories, they've actually got a they get a number from our government. It's like everybody's got it. It's it's. But it, it does, some stuff works here. It, it does. Um, but we're, we're on like a war, like we're on a permanent wartime footing. We don't have, for example, we don't have jury trials. We've got like the British legal system, but without juries. So, yeah. cause we got like a wartime British system and it just got frozen with that. Um, so I, I was once on a jury in the UK, uh, but, but yeah, here, nothing like that. Well, and they point. didn't let you have one, did they? Yeah, no, I never got a jury, but uh, the good thing is, uh, criminal record, I'm exempt from jury duty you now. <laughs> hey, <laughs> every cloud. <laughs> oh, it wasn't so bad. I spent like a, I spent two weeks in the old Bailey reading a Tom Wolfe novel. It was it was pre-internet days, pre pre-mobile phones. I think I read one of you know one of those massive thick uh, <laughs> books. You usually get paid for it now, don't you? They cover your costs of your employment and all that stuff. They they rig there, yeah. They compensate your employer and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, here the the equivalent here is that, and you know, fortunately, most of my staff no, it's like people have army duty up until they're they're thirty five or forty here. So if you have staff, then you know, a couple couple weeks a year they go off to train with their unit. Except one time I had a lawyer working for me and um, I wanted him to do some work at the weekend. And uh, and I was like, it really needed to be done at the weekend. And I said, can you can you work this weekend? He said, I'm sorry, I really, I can't work this weekend. I absolutely, I can't. I said, why? He says, I've got to do my army service. And I was like, that's weird. Because normally army service is like a week or two weeks. Yeah. And he, he was just one day. He said, no, 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 I'm an F-16 pilot. And I've missed two weeks now. And if I don't fly this weekend, then I'm in a whole shit ton of trouble with having to requalify. Um, and I was like, you do my shitty little legal work all week long. And then at the weekend, you jump in an F-16 and go flying. It's like, well, how does that work? Who wants to be a lawyer and then a part-time F-16 pilot? I don't know. Like, you need to spice it up, like, because being a, being a lawyer does sound boring. I'm <laughs> so sorry. From what I've heard from our lawyers, they've said that 99% of the job doesn't even involve the courtroom. There's no, 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 this was corporate law, this was drafting contracts, this was the dullest stuff ever. And then, <laughs> and then he tells me, no, I've got to fly on Saturday. It's like, fly what? An F-16. And I'm, can you take me? <laughs> You need something to keep you sane. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we've got an entire, you know, because we've got we've got like more than three pilots for each plane. So yeah. in the event in the event that SA shit that, that shit gets real, we can keep each each plane flying just about you know as hard as it can possibly go. With we've got you know three flight crews, so we've got this enormous cohort of reserve F sixteen pilots and F F. Uh, F-15s and all that stuff. Yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, I've only, I only, the only thing I've ever done was I did a army cadet basic, and the cadets uh, technically isn't the real army. Uh, the cadets is essentially the army meets Boy Scouts. That's what I did, and uh, I did, I did a sort of equivalent to basic, and uh, this ended up turning into this massive meme, where constantly people on streams say thank you for your service. Trying to, act, 
<laughs> trying to act like I'm ex SAS and all this type of stuff, and trying to say that I fought in Helmand. It's grew arms and legs because I actually had a person asking me, "Oh, where did you get deployed?" And I had to <laughs> like. That's that's just a meme. Yeah, sure. <laughs> none, of, none, of, none of that's real. Everyone see the people in the chat are kicking off about it already. Everyone, <laughs> thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> Stolen valor when you have valor like given to you by people. <laughs> Fuck Dank it. was a child soldier. Yeah, I see. Actually, in fact, my background, actually, I was born in South Africa, but I renounced my South, Af- my South African citizenship uh, when I turned 17. And I, I, was, I was living in Britain since I was a baby. Um, when I turned 17, they sent me my call up papers for the South African army. And this was the old South Africa. This is pre Mandela and all this stuff. And they were actually fighting a proper shooting war in Namibia against guys I think called uh, uh, Swapo. It was, it was a proper shooting war. They were crawling around in the desert and jungles and all sorts of crap, killing blacks and, you know, <laughs> shooting people. And um, they, <laughs> they sent me my call-up papers. I returned 17. And they said, report your news recruiting office in Johannesburg. And I sent them back my passport. And I said, fuck this for a game of... And, I, and that's when I actually took my British citizenship. Um, and then, and then years later, when Mandela got out, and you know everything changed. So then I get this letter in the post saying, um, "Would you like to become a South African citizen again? No army service required. You know, sort of, sort of service guarantee. What's that service guarantee citizenship?" Or, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but then, then so then I read the small print, and it was like send five hundred pounds, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" I do not need a South African passport for 500 quid. Thank you very much. So South Africa doesn't sound like the best place to go to right now. I've heard They're that. not big fans of Israel and Jews because uh, they, they had like a bit of a backlash. I think, I think basically they knew, everybody worked out that we helped, their, their and our nuclear weapons programs were linked. Uh, yeah. And yeah. so <laughs> like, if if something went bang in the middle of the desert, it was probably theirs and ours. So, um, yeah, it's not. Uh, uh, I, I yeah, I've got no desire to go back or to reclaim my lost South African citizenship. You, you give it um, away state secrets here. <laughs> <laughs> there's probably there's probably already a thread on poll about this stream now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's a Wikipedia pages about it, so which <laughs> of course is the book of knowledge. It must be right. <laughs> Fucking hell, man! But uh, are yeah. people enjoying this? Am I being hammered for the the my doing you or uh, I don't know? I, yeah, I think uh, a few people were. Uh, I think people just seen the flag and just immediately assumed that you yeah. were. Like, well, that's mostly yeah. just to cover my kids organizational crap so uh <laughs> no i think uh, i think you won you won a few people over when you were saying uh, you know the west the west must prevail <laughs> and all well, that. you must just fucking yeah. fight for it don't give in stop it stop it you do not need to lose but you've got to you know i tell you what i'm not i'm personally not religious i'm not observant i drive on shabbat i Sometimes if somebody were to put a lobster in front of me, I would eat it hungrily. <laughs> but, um, and because, lo- you know, both pork and lobster are on the same sort of kosher, not kosher bar. Yeah. I could live without pork, but I, lobster, I really, you know, I do miss <laughs> lobster. It's hard to get a good lobster here. But, but nevertheless, I tell you what, I have come to realize that Judaism and Christianity are they are civilizational super technologies this thing of of restricting restricting sex actually you know keeping and families and the nuclear family and and they they gave the west this unbelievable technological boost i'm not into the whole iq iq differences type thing Uh, i'm not saying it's not real to some degree i'm not saying it but i think more more so than that the cultural super technology there's a thing called biohistory which a guy in australia has written which is unbelievable but 
something happened in Britain with the Industrial Revolution and with sort of the whole way that Victorian society was organized, especially at the upper levels. That, that created this unbelievable technological progress. And for sure, the, the, the way in which society was organized along religious lines, but that, that made all the difference. That's what gave us our start. And I see in Israel, it's like we, we've got a purpose. We know who we are. We've got an identity. We're allowed to have our Jewish identity. That's not to say we haven't. We've got Moroccan Jews and Yemeni Jews. I mean, like the guy the, the, at the beach I go to in the summer, the, the lifeguard is a Yemeni Jew. He is as black as, you know, he's, he's dark, really dark. Yeah. And he's totally different from me and totally different background, different foods and stuff. But he's got this value system that aligns with ours. And when we had all these Jewish, uh, all these Jews come in from Russia, we had, we had 10 million Jews in, in, in about 1989 when the wall came down and Russia opened up. The population of Israel, I think, was something like four and a half, 4.5 million. It went up in the next 10 years. It went up to over 5.7 million. And that includes Arabs, okay? Yeah. We took in, we took in um, 1 million Russian Jews in 10 years into a population that went from 4.5 to 5.5. 7 million, okay? 20% of our population in 10 years. Right. Think of that. Think of Britain was, what, you've got 70 million people. Now think of taking 20%, so that would be oh yeah. God, 18 million people in 10 years. Even Germany, we're taking 2 million in a year or two. It's nothing like what, what Israel did. So that was mass immigration on a scale that's never been seen anywhere else in the developed world ever. OK, but they were Jews coming here to be Jews. And I think one of the last things I'll tell you, soon after I arrived here uh, 10 years ago, I went to see a Davis Cup tennis match. And you remember the you, you remember the Tebbit test? No, you know the, no. the Norman. The, this was I'm a bit older than you. So the Tebbit test was proposed by Norman Tebbit. And he said, if you're at a cricket match in Birmingham, Right. And it's between England and, let's say, Pakistan. Who is the crowd cheering for? <laughs> oh, fuck. Right, okay. And he got in a heck of a lot of trouble for this. And that was the Tebbit test. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, I, so I went to this tennis match, and it was a Davis Cup tennis match between Israel and Russia. And it was in a big uh, basketball stadium, the biggest sort of stadium in Tel Aviv for basketball. And sure enough, it, it was between Russia and Israel. And, you know, just 10 years earlier, we'd had a million Russians arrive here. And, and the major impact of that is that if you like phone up like the telephone company, it's pushed one for Hebrew, pushed two for Arabic, pushed three for Russian, bugger off English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Russian just pushed English off the menus. But inside that room, in that hall, and it was all Israelis, and I was hearing a lot of Russian being spoken, they were cheering for Israel. There was just a little crowd of visiting Russian supporters cheering for Russia. But these were all Russian origin Israelis, but they were Israelis because yeah. they came here to be Israeli. That's sort of over and that they were Jewish and Israeli, but we we've done it. We've managed to find an identity that does unite us all. And that's what Europe, that's what England should be able to have an English identity. Now, it doesn't mean everybody has to go down the pub and drink a beer, but you should absolutely respect that that is what, that's normal. I think, I think that is, that is the main issue that we are having here. Like, see, for example, you had a, what was the name of it? I forget, I forget what it was called, but we had a huge influx of migrants uh, in the 60s. I completely forget what it was Yeah, the, the, the Windrush, uh, Wind, Windrush generation. Right. Those people came over here and they acclimatised. They they became yeah. British. But the case was, then even, you know, maybe even a little bit after that, people came over here, you know, they weren't, they weren't 
you know, coming the way they are now. They came here to be British. They came here to be Scottish, to be English, to be Welsh, take part in the culture, take part... Learn actually. the language, take part in the culture. Yeah. doesn't mean you don't have to actually like black pudding, but just don't get upset if someone's eating it next to you. And that white stuff you guys have is just vile, but... Yeah, but, like, like this this is the thing is as well, is that people are coming here, they're not coming here to be British, and I think that is what the problem is. There aren't people that are coming here to share in our morals and ethics and culture and stuff like that. They want to still stick with theirs, which obviously is causing, you know, an abrasive environment with everybody else, which is why there is so much tension. Right That's now. it, but you've got to assert yourselves, and this is what, what you've been told you're not allowed to do, which we haven't been told that here. We, we know what Israeli is. Now, there's all sorts of different streams of Judaism. There's different classes of, of religiousness and non-religiousness. And there's there's different traditions that the Moroccans have. I mean, like we have this big argument once a year um, between all of the Jews from Arab lands and all of the Jews from European lands. We at Passover, OK, we, we're we're not we're prohibited from eating certain foods. OK, we can't eat leavened bread is the one that everybody knows. Matzah versus bread. But what you don't know, and is a huge deal here, is that Jews of Arabic origin can eat rice and other pulses, whereas mm. Jews of Ashkenazi descent, the rabbis have said, though I think that's on the turn now, I think any, any year now it could be erased, they're not supposed to eat rice and pulses. And at least this subdivision in restaurants is like, is this a restaurant where you can eat these things? I mean, it's just stupid stuff. But... <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, this is the country where we can have this squabble, okay? This is our place. And we, we have this big fight over whether they should build this high-speed railway on the weekends. And the religious don't want us to build the high-speed railway on the on the weekends. But at least we have the fight here. We're not, we're not imposing our rules elsewhere generally. And I get really upset when Jews abroad start trying to impose, you know, any kind of Jewish observances on other people. Well, that's not for us. This is our little country. This is where we can do that stuff and yeah. have those fights. And and Britain, Scotland, just be yourselves. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the thing we want. Like, I believe that nation states should exist. I believe that we should have borders. Each, you know, country has a culture, and if that's the culture that the people have adopted, then that should be respected. Just the same as as long as they respect it with us. Like, uh, And I think a lot of the reason as well is... Um, People are constantly telling us you're not allowed to have your identity, you're not allowed to have national pride, you're not allowed to have any of that. You know, if you do, you're a racist. Like, I want to be proud of my country. We've got a we've got a very, very long history of being great warriors. We were fierce. You know, there you was drove around you drove your the, the navy around the world erasing slavery. This is the greatest achievement of the British Empire. Without the British Empire, slavery, you know, it was the British Navy, the British Empire that said, you know, one day there was a political decision made in London and suddenly across the entire world, slavery became much more difficult to do. And the only places it clings on today are where, where Islam is still a retrograde force in the world and, and, you know, all the people smuggling that goes on with all the nonsense because people don't enforce borders properly. Yeah. A, there is still slavery as well. I think uh, Saudi Arabia, not the capital, well, well I, you know, I, I think I might be I might be wrong on that no, one. I, I think they hide it better there. But I mean, like <laughs> whoever's building the, I don't think that the conditions for the people building the stadiums for the World Cup in uh, is in Dubai in twenty twenty two or whatever it is twenty four oh, twenty yeah. whenever. I mean, that's going to be slavery. Oh yeah, no, I've heard. I've actually heard quite a few horror stories about uh, the conditions of workers. Apparently, there's scaffoldings collapsing people are getting crushed people are getting damaged and all that type of stuff just because they they fucking they don't care yeah they don't yeah. care yeah but yeah uh, do you want me to be brave and uh read some of that i've been missing out in super you chat. can read read some super chats i'll answer anything <laughs> you brave 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 man <laughs> hold on just to uh, find it oh right. i've run out of whiskey though Sketchy Meatball, Absolute Mad Lads, Ned Kelly, that's a common request. Uh, Spectre, this already looks like a, ju a, a joke. A Jew and an anti-Semite start a video call. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
McCarthy's list, I have a question. Why haven't you sued them for defamation considering they lied about you being a current Nazi? You have videos denouncing it. Ah, that's just the way the press work. Plus, I don't you can't. Know. Listen, I, I've looked at this and I've worked with Tommy's legal people. In fact, back in that, I'll tell you a little short story. Back in the very, back in the days of the EDL, I wanted the EDL to, to fight over the term far right because they were not far right. Yeah. I'll tell you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. I helped with the charter of the EDL. And one of the bits that I got put into the charter, okay, I'll, I'm going to tell this story in public. This will go wild now. Um, so, <laughs> so when it was, I was in a, a, like a, a Skype chat room. That was where all the work got done. And we were bashing about this charter for the EDL. And I was just one, one of many. And one of the things, I just got back from America. And in America, I'd been at this event. And I'd sat at a breakfast next to the head of the NRA, the American National Rifle Association. Yeah. And the head of the NRA at that time was this little Jewish woman, funnily enough. <laughs> uh, Jews do control, yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> NRA, I mean, the National Rifle Association. Anyway, so she had said something to me that I had never, it just blew my mind. And it, it actually changed my worldview. She said, the NRA is a human rights organization fighting for the right to self-defense. And it is, and that's yeah. exactly what they are. And they don't want the UN to come in and take away your right to self-defense, which is what the UN wants to do with globalism. So I came back to England and I, and, and then I came a few years later, I mean, I'm already living in Israel and I'm working on this document for the EDL. And they, they, we're like trying to work out the first line of this basic thing. And, I, and we're talking about street protests. And I said, no, you know what we need to do? We need to call the EDL a human rights organization fighting for the right to peacefully protest. And that went into the EDL charter. So the EDL was a human rights organization. And that was just a shit post against the entire edifice of social justice warriors and their human rights organizations. That's fucking funny. That's good. That's clever. And so every time they called us far right, and they called the EDL far right, we would point out, I mean, it never did any good. The press never picked up on this. But sometimes they would write a self-proclaimed human rights organization. I get, <laughs> Something like that. I get, I get self-proclaimed comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get that an awful lot. Yeah. But that's, that's the press. They are... You know, you know what they're like. They'll just willfully misrepresent you all the bloody time. Like the thing is, as well, the, the EDL did end up running away from Tommy. Of course, and and but but the what you know, I I looked at them from the early days because what had happened was I'd been really involved with a whole load of counter jihad people. In fact, your friend Gerard Batten. Yeah. In two thousand and seven, I met him in Brussels. We held a counter jihad conference in Brussels. This is all sort of on the record buried in deep dark corners of the internet on, on a website called Gates of Vienna, I think is where you'll find stuff about this. And Gerald Batten actually sponsored him and one other UKIP guy whose name I can't remember. And we knew Batten was good on Jihad, but Farage was always, he, he would never let anyone talk about it. And Pearson was also great, but what all the time Farage was leading it, they'd never touch Islam. And, I think it was the biggest mistake ever because instead of talking about immigration, you should always have been talking about unassimilating immigration. It's like yeah. you can have some immigration. You should definitely limit it. It should never be unlimited. It should be what you want. But as soon as you let people in who just have no intention of assimilating, you're screwed. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what's causing the problems. And see, the thing that's, I think, one of the main things that's exacerbating it is a, See, because obviously, like I said before, like cultures, there's an abrasive environment, so cultures are clashing. Uh, the government is basically saying, oh, these minorities need to be protected. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass laws on hate crime, hate speech, all this type of stuff. And, oh. and I'll, I'll apologise just, just to the, the chat room. I will apologise for the role of any far... I shouldn't be held accountable for what far-left Jews do in the diaspora. But I will say I am just as disgusted by them and i'm disgusted by the people who prosecuted you as as anybody else even more so because i feel some kind of you know just annoying annoyance that i have to be lumped into a tribe with these people because 
ideologically and everything in my brain works different to them that's for sure yeah i th- i think i think a lot of some people probably just seen the israeli flag and just assumed oh this guy's clearly a globalist he's clearly he's all about israeli identity but europe's not allowed to have an identity israel yeah. is the absolute example this is why soros is trying to destroy us soros work every single ngo that hates israel is funded by soros open society funds all of the worst bastards against Israel. They hate Israel because we are the most modern nation state that is a massive success. We are the proof of the viability and of the power and of what is great about a nation state. Poland is great. I mean, I, I'm like, I'm trying to work with the Poles to get over this stupid argument that we're having with them. Because I think what's happened is there's a far, there's a stupid far right element in Poland that has been goaded into making stupid stuff, saying stupid stuff. And then there's a far left element in the diaspora of Jews and in Israel that has been goaded into having. And then somewhere in the center, there's people like me who's, who are just like, I went to Poland um last year and i went to their museum of the resistance to the the nazis they fought like bastards they really fought the nazis properly now they killed a lot of jews and and the nazis killed a lot of jews in poland but it's like everybody was killing jews it's like i wasn't i don't i we don't have to have that fight i would be very happy to see a strong poland and i love what they're doing about promoting babies you know promoting women who want to have four children and hungary's doing this too and that's yeah. the future for europe have have babies no that's 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 something that's absolutely true instead of like i, I think it was a uh, hungary i forget the guy's name but uh, Orban. He, Orban. Uh, it was a case of instead of a uh, replacing our population we should be encouraging our prop our population to grow itself so basically yeah, they've said no taxes if you have more than four kids Phew. yeah like that's that's something that we should be doing you know basically everyone that's in indigenous to the nation state needs to start fucking <laughs> we need to start having kids up like what's that. wrong with that policy it's like but this is the, this is the countries that are optimistic do that um countries that are pessimistic you know they just sit around trying to work out how to afford a nicer car and it that's not listen the kids we sacrifice for our kids but i don't know i've got kids you know it's like i can't think of life without kids i think that's, that's literally the goal of any sort of living carbon-based being is to procreate that's literally what we're about to do since birth that's millions of years of evolution which is why I don't trust the fact that, you know, the world leaders right now, you know, like Sturgeon, et cetera, they, yeah. they don't have kids. See, they Trump's don't. got plenty of kids. I like that. Different yeah. wives, multiple children. Yeah, it's like, yes. Yeah. His, but- seed, his seed will, you know, president, I, though I, I wouldn't be all that impressed if his daughter or his son-in-law became president. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> read some more of your super chats. Let's get through some more. The hard ones. Give me the hard ones. I'll do anything now. I'll, I'll try and power through them and we'll stop on a good one. Uh, Seth Odom, remember when Robert Downey Jr. played blackface for the entirety of a major motion <laughs> picture? I, I remember that. I thought it was quite funny. Uh, Seth Odom again. Remember the Armenian genocide because the Turks don't. <laughs> Listen, I've been, I've been tweeting about that every year and I think it's a disgrace that Israel hasn't officially recognised it more. So um, I'm with the Armenian. The Armenian genocide was definitely the prototype for Hitler. I, he looked at that. He looked at what the Mufti was saying and he said, hmm, well, they got away with it. We can do better. We're, we can industrialize this shit because at least, you know, they're German and they had the IBM computers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I opened a can of whip ass there, didn't I? A little bit, Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, Ross Holt, Dank, did you see Sargon rape Destiny yesterday? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, Joker Fake, uh, do you acknowledge that the 1967 border is Israel's last <laughs> legitimately earned border? <laughs> no. Okay, I- I'll give it to you very, very quickly. The last border of the actual, the last thing that anybody would recognize as a legal nation state border was the Ottoman, em- was, was the division of the Ottoman Empire that israel sits in today and that included all of jordan and trans what what became known as trans jordan and a chunk of syria too that was the last time 
this uh, that that was the last time there was an internationally recognized border in this area so the 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 border that we had in 1967 was actually the border that happened in 1949 which was when we fought to a ceasefire and that ceasefire I'll tell you one more little story. 1949, the, the war of 1948-49, which we call the Independence War, we couldn't hold Jerusalem. We didn't have enough troops and we didn't have enough supplies. So we lost half of Jerusalem and we lost the area that's called Judea and Samaria. To the right, to my, to my left is the sea, about 15, 17 kilometers. That way is Judea, Samaria, the green line. That's how close it is where I am in Tel Aviv. We lost that area because we, we just couldn't hold it. Uh, Jordan took all of that. Uh, Egypt took Gaza. Jordan took half of Jerusalem. They proceeded to throw all the Jews who had lived in that half of Jerusalem out, destroyed all the, the, the synagogues, and took all the Jews out and all the holy places they took it uh, over. And they called it, they couldn't, you see, they could. They had to rename it. It was. It was called Judea in the south and Samaria in the north. But that didn't like sound right because they didn't like saying Judea because it's Judea. Yeah. So they called it West Bank, i.e., the West Bank of the Jordan River. That that had never existed as a as a that that unit of land had never been in any way autonomous or anything but connected with what was next to it. And so when we took it back in sixty seven. Um, it just works, honestly. And um, it's not so bad. Uh, you have to come here and see. Anybody who wants to come here, I'll drive you through. I drove all the way through it with Tommy, from top to bottom and bottom to top. We, went, we drove backwards and forwards across Judea, Samaria. Um, we went through checkpoints. We went through not checkpoints. We saw where the Jews live. We walked in Bethlehem with Arabs in an Arab refugee camp that has been kept there. It's like a living monument. It's like just a, it's just a rundown slum. It, but it's called an Unrawa refugee camp called Daisha actually. And Tommy went in there and he was really nervous going in and we walked through it and he bashed a football about with some kids. And when we come out the other side of this thing and he says, you know what, that's safer than Luton. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you know. <laughs> so yeah, it's the, the impression you have is is totally and utterly messed up. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. uh, I'll, I'll answer. Continue with these. No, that was good. That was good. Okay, there's people. That I'm I'm noticing the chat. You're you're running people over. By the way, see see the more you go on about a uh, European, you know, nation state should have their identity. Your well, wife. you should. I'm. Yeah. I, listen, I'm not quite with Martin Selner and the and the uh, generation identity, but I, I I get some of their points. And and there is like a there is like a there is a positive nationalism. Um, Yoram Hazoni actually has a fantastic book out that I have not read. In fact, I'm going to meet him at some point. I need to get a copy of that book. They, this is the way to go. Positive nationalism without the racism, accepting of some internal diversity, but without like being lunatics about promoting it. Fair enough, there you go. I've got this one guy. Uh, there is only one right. Small government for the win. The right to be left alone should be upheld, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Um, Philip Abudi, the UK Human Rights Act 1998 actually does have a section on freedom of expression. Uh, look at that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I've seen that. But it's a case of uh, you've got a right, but the government can take it away for you know X, Y, and Z vague reasons. It's the same as uh, Article Ten. Uh, this is Sharia dimitude. It's like you have you do not have the right to life because that you you can have one benevolent ruler and next week you get another ruler and your right to life is gone. That yeah. seems to be what's happened in the UK. Can you imagine, like Tom Watson, this guy who wrote this letter saying Tommy should be kicked off YouTube? Yeah, Can yeah. you imagine him actually running the country? Oh, yeah. Digital czar, whatever he'll become. He's Labour. I, I mean, like, he's Labour as well. He's Labour. He's, he's the deputy. I think he's lining up for, for a bid against Corbyn, to be honest. But he has no hope. But Corbyn, I mean, how if you do Corbyn, you really are up the swanny. Oh, I mean, oh no. I, I have a fear of a Corbyn government because these are the type of people. Because see how... Most of the attacks that we get is it comes from people who are aligned with Labour. 
and it's sort of we want to go and talk about free speech, individual liberty, and all that type of stuff as well. And you know, it's okay for you to have an identity and all that type of stuff. And we're the people that they come after, which is why I'm looking at them going, "You guys are fucking authoritarians." Like, that's why you want rid of people like us because we're talking about freedom. We want exactly. people to have freedom. I just saw some after. someone in the chat just said. Israel is the cultural capital of the world, which I agree with. In fact, I think what's happening is Western civilization is turning to Jerusalem. America is withdrawing into itself. And Jerusalem is actually going to be the cultural capital of the world again, because you're going to realize that Judeo-Christianity as a system under, of, an, of underlying ethics cannot be beaten. You don't have to be ultra-religious, but there's some good shit in in. in you know, like Jordan Peterson is pointing this out all the time. But he then says the UN should move from New York to Jerusalem. No, F off. The UN should be kicked out of Israel and the UN should cease to exist. We do not need a UN. There should be no global overlord because the UN has been completely captured by the OIC, the Organization of the Islamic Conference or Congress or whatever they're calling themselves this week. Get yeah. rid of the lot of them. I'm pretty, I'm, okay. pretty sure, I'm pretty sure this is the same UN that put uh, Saudi Arabia on the Human Rights Council. <laughs> exactly, and Iran as well. And I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? And then all they do is write resolutions because we shot some terrorists on the Gaza border. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you another story with Tommy. We, took, we went down to the Gaza border. So we drive and we were in the car. It was me, my tour guide friend, uh, and we were with an Isra Israeli Arab. Um, called, uh, uh, no, I'm not going to say his name. He's yeah, in the yeah. army now. He's actually in the army now. And um, he's he's basically been kicked out of his village, his Arab village. He can never go back there because he, he did a pro-Israel pro post on Facebook and the town council shared it on their Facebook page. And the police turned up at his door five minutes later and said, get the hell out of town. Um, anyway, he's in the Israeli army now, but he was with us in the car with Tommy. So we drive to the, the border with Gaza and there's a sign that says, you know, military closed zone, don't go in here. So my tour guide friend says she's not going to go past this sign. So I get out of the car with Tommy and the guys and we walk past the sign. We climb this little observation tower and I see all these video cameras and I know what's happening. So these video cameras all swivel to look at us and we climb this tower and we look out and this Jeep in Gaza, it's about 800 meters behind the fence. And we see this Jeep, you know, the, not Jeep, the, 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 the Toyota Hilux white pickup, you know, the ISIS car. Yeah. And it's got like these six guys, two, two in the front, four in the back. And they don't actually have visible weapons, but uh, they had weapons. And so we're looking at them through like a big telephoto camera lens. And they're looking at us through binoculars. And then about, we were up there a minute and a half, two minutes, and then two Israeli army jeeps converge from different directions on our position and shout at me and tell me to come down. And, <laughs> and, then, I, and then I like forgot all my Hebrew and I was like totally British. And I was like, oh, i terribly sorry. I didn't see the sign. Are we still not supposed to be here? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and, and they asked for my ID, which I did not show them because if I had, I would have been in deep shit. And um, then we took pictures with them all. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they said to it, and then they said, you, you were in some considerable danger. They could easily have shot you. That was Hamas. That's who you were looking at. Um, Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm Boston, so I'm gonna quickly nip to the toilet. Uh, you can have some fun okay. with that if you want. <laughs> Where's the chat? All right, we'll go on a bit longer. Oh, what's going on in the chat? Selfies cure everything. Christ was a carpenter and Jewish. Rest pepperonis. Christ, we had a good time actually. Um, with Tommy, what else did we do? We went to see an Aramaic priest. Okay, so I'll tell you something about Christians here. There's Arab Christians, and then there's Aramaic Christians. And the Aramaic Christians are fighting for an indigenous identity that is non-Arab because they were here before the Arab invasions. And Aramaic is the language of Jesus to a certain degree. And there is a quite considerable grouping of Christians who trace their Christianity back before the Arab invasions. And um, they speak Aramaic and I would class them, there's actually, they are 
they have a completely ident indigenous identity. And we also have some on a place called Mount Grugim, which is also just to my east, um, overlooking a town called Shechem, which is also known as Nablus. We have the Samaritans who are still there on this hill. And they have a kind of, it's not Islam, it's not Christianity, and it's not Judaism. It's, it's a bizarre, it's more, Christi it's more Jewish and a bit Christian, and they live on this hill. And again, they are one of the other indigenous identities of Israel. I'm just explaining the indigenous identities of Israel. So Jewish, wow. indigenous, uh, the, the Samaritans on Mount Grigim, and Aramaic Christians. And, and there's a famous picture, actually, of Tommy with this big priest-looking guy. And um, that was in the office of this guy called Father Nadav, who is an Aramaic Christian, i.e., he, he speaks Aramaic and his Christianity predates the Arab invasions. Uh, so, you know, most of the Christians here are Arab Christians. Um, and they, I tell you what, I, I've talked with a few of them. They have a messed up version of the Bible because their Bible is kind of corrupted by the Quran. Whereas wow. the Aramaic Christians are, they're using a much better version of the bible closer to what you would read in a king james edition it's very it's, it's i tell you there's a hell of a lot of subtlety going on and there's a hell of a lot of weird mixes going on here <sighs> hell, man. so they're a me melting pot almost well that's the other thing and then then everybody tells me i'm a white ashkenazi and i need to go back to kazaria or whatever it is you have absolutely no idea how diverse i mean god help me but yes <laughs> Jews are diverse. We are not racially uh, homogeneous. We, we are a hell of a mix. And it's getting more mixed because we're married, you know, okay, which the IQ guys then are going to go, well, you're going to lose your Ashkenazi privilege. Well, you know, okay, so what? But this place is not a white European outpost in the middle of the, of, of the Middle East, by no means. And in fact, I cannot tell Arabs from Jews most of the time unless I hear them speak. And even then, there are Arabs who speak such good Hebrew that I wouldn't know they were Arabs. Like, like the doctors in the hospitals. You can be treated by a doctor. His Hebrew is way, way better than mine, and it's perfect to, to any degree. And then you see the name tag, and it says Muhammad, and you had no clue. And that's just normal. That's fucking I didn't know that. I didn't know any of that. You know, I think the first time, the first time when my kid was really young and something happened and we had to go to the emergency room, you know, it was a big guy called Muhammad that stuck a needle in my son. Just the nurses are Arabs and Jews and mixed. It's just like that. That's fucking quite cool then. Well, yeah. I'm going to power through these. Because I, no, I feel we have to finish. I got to I got to go to bed. It's late. No, no, it's fine. If you, if you want to, I don't mind reading them myself. If you want to answer them, then feel free to hang around. I can't. I don't. Can I see the super chats? I don't know. Yeah, oh no, I, I, I just need to read them out. Well, you I, read them out. That's fine. Yeah. A guy, uh, Simon Robert Lane, reminder Jerry Sadowitz, regards from Chol Colchester. He is a for anyone that doesn't know, he is a edgy comedian that he, ma he makes me look like a pussy. He makes me look like a pussy. <laughs> Um, Ryan Buck, I bet Dank has a fat Glock. Um, Scott, <laughs> Scott Jonesy, your keyboard is bent. Uh, someone's obviously, whenever I'm in voice chat and Discord, I type all the time and people get really angry at my loud keyboard. Uh, Mitch, happened to Sam and Rushdie 30 years ago too. Fuck, people are bringing that shit back up again as well. Austin, it's real. Oh yeah, fuck, fuck yeah. Um, the Nazis were fighting for culture and homeland. Jews immigrated to Germany and refused to assimilate to the existing culture. They paid the price. Jeez. That's actually that's actually totally wrong. And in fact, what got so many of the Jews in Germany was that they thought they were Germans and they were not German enough ever. And that's the point of racial laws is that their racial laws were, were absolute. It was like you had to drop a Jewish blood and you, you were Jewish. Off you go. And that no matter how assimilated they were, how much pork they were eating, how unobservant they were, it didn't count. The Nazis killed them. And that's, 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 what, ra that's what racial law is. Yeah. South Africa had a similar thing. I've got a birth certificate from South Africa that says race white. Today, I don't think of myself as white. I'm Jewish, damn it. I'm not white. I don't want your, I don't want your stinking white privilege. 
<laughs> fuck, that's good. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, <laughs> fucking hell. Um, Jim Jenkins, I thought you didn't smoke, you absolute job. I know, I'll be I'll be making another attempt to quit soon. Uh, Sudi the Cuff, Marcus, bless you, man. I need to check optics on something. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, thanks, yeah. Christ. Uh, Fraser McBurney, seeing you light up reminded me I had a couple of cigars, so now I'm enjoying a good smoke with you. I do not encourage or condone smoking. Everyone should quit. I'm, I'm obviously not leading by example. Um, <laughs> Uh, Scott Jonesy, when will MGM be prosecuted? Uh, Todger Lives Matter, I think that's male genital mutilation. And uh, Graf on Tyro, uh, I, if I recall correctly, uh, Indians and West Indians have been rather well-adjusted. Brits said they were because it was part of the empire and yeah. culture and all that type of but stuff. But I tell you what, if they, adopt, if they adopt Islam in the prisons, you've got a big trouble. Oh, no, that's, that's one thing that UKIP gets all the time. It's like, oh, you're, you're planning on having Muslim-only prisons, and it's like, that's not what got played at all. You're getting, you're getting radical Muslim gangs in prisons who are, you know, through threats of violence, you know, convert to Islam or we will come after you. It's basically a case of, you know, if there is a problem prisoner, you know, if you find out prisoners are running extortion rackets or threats and all that type of stuff, you, you separate them from the other prisoners. If there's problem prisoners, you separate them from general population. That's, that's we have codes like that. America has that. A lot of countries have that. So what we're doing is, if that's now just something else that's going to be added to it, like Muslims and non-Muslims are still going to be together in prisons. It's just that if there is a Muslim gang that's, you know, threatening people with violence if they don't convert, then they'll be separated to prevent them from doing that. Because, you know, the, the prisoners have a right to not be assaulted, even though if they are in prison, you know, the prison has a duty of care for the well-being of the prisoner. So that um, just makes sense to do that. Uh, the thing, my uncle wants to thank you for pulling him out of that burning humphy. I thank God every day that he's still with us. Bless you, for fuck's sake. <laughs> See what I mean? GT4, right? Yeah. <laughs> also, we, we don't use Humvees. <laughs> right, uh, today for Dr. Brian, I see the social justice Western far left degenerate plague has infected a good majority of your student Israeli youth within Tel Aviv, uh, Generation Z plus Millennial. Your thoughts on the matter? That's a good point. Yeah, well, I, you know what? It, it does, it gets them. But I tell you what, I tell you what instills. We do have a counterbalance here, which is the army is a big damn it's a big counterbalance that really is a big dose of reality for most kids uh, yeah. and i think our kids are better for it um we have a we we do have a somewhat of a problem coming up with numbers because we've we've got too many babies the aftermath of a million russians in 10 years is that we've got a big baby boom coming through the system now and over the next few years we're going to have trouble working out what to do with all the youngsters that are becoming army age and whether we want them in an army that's incredibly mechanized and and all of this stuff but societally we still i think we must have the army the army serves an amazing role in our society in unifying it and bonding it but but yeah you know tel aviv university which is not far from me it is an absolute ridiculous cesspool of insanity like all the other left things i'm just i i don't know why my kids would want to go to, to university honestly uh, I, don't, I, I think the university should disappear because as far as I'm concerned, I did a physics degree. And if I go watch the Richard Feynman lectures on YouTube, that's better than most of what I got in my undergraduate degree. I could just sit there. You could learn everything I learned in my undergraduate degree there. Um, universities and, and if, if my kids turn around and want to go and study sociology, I, I don't know what I will do. <laughs> but, you know, universities are apparently, especially in places like Berkeley and stuff like that, like uh, they're actually losing funding because students don't want to go there because you're basically getting people who are, you know, right wing, like not even even just a tiny bit centre right. In fact, some a lot of left wing people as well because they're not left wing enough are not wanting to go to universities, like certain ones, because they're like, no, because when I go there, I'm just going to get shit constantly for what I think. I'm going to get forced to go on this gender studies course which is for some reason being made necessary for me to get my credits and yeah. all that it's like people people don't want anything to do with that i like, i i don't want my kids to want that i don't know i you know i don't know what what the i don't know what the, the environment will look like but i tell you this i noticed about my kids they can learn anything on youtube it is insane 
I mean, like, you know, my kids are getting into gaming a little bit, you know, Fortnite and oh. Overwatch and and um tracking the the tracking the sub gap on PewDiePie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the the stuff that they can learn to do on their own once once they've learned the principle of searching youtube it's quite amazing and and there's a self-guided learning thing that i'm really my wife thinks it's dreadful but i'm quite impressed it's very different to what i grew up with you know because we had to look in books and go to the library and stuff it's just whole things different now with where you where you have i've got the entire world's knowledge in front of me right now it's, it's unbelievable yeah it's, I, I would i'd probably say it's an easy argument to make that the internet was probably the greatest thing that ever got invented like purely because now anyone in the world that has the connection can access a yeah, porn at all times of the day and night yeah, picture your local library, you know, which back in the day was your was your bastion of knowledge. You now have something like a million times as powerful as that in your hand. Like and, and like that's that's why it's amazing. Like I feel that worldwide everyone is going to become more intelligent because of the internet. I, I hope so. Uh, I there's also there's a counter argument that we're all getting a lot dumber, but I don't know. I, I we'll see. I think I think that they'll be okay. But yeah, the, we have a left wing student. But like everywhere, people that you were a lefty when you were young. That's yeah. just normal. Uh, fortunately, I think people grow out of it. There's a big thing on my blog actually called Mundia Modia. I won't go into it now, but it's a theory about whether you're based in a world that deals with social things or deals with the real world. And um, yeah, we'll. We are better rooted here in Israel, I am sure, but we still have a left-wing stupid, stupid problem here. Yeah, I think most it comes from kids, mostly. It comes, yeah. yeah. And yeah. socialism and not working out that it always fails. Someone asked about um, Bedouin. I'll just say something quickly. The Bedouin are really complicated um, because oh, they're hard to deal with and they, they, they definitely, they, we, I've, bumped into a few better in good for good and for bad. Uh, they have been here a long time too, but they move around. But now they're, they're, they're unfortunately in the grip of the same kind of uh, victim culture and um, dependency on state handouts. And yeah. as soon as a population gets that into their mind, everything goes to to hell you know and, yeah. and it is it's this left-wing thing stop giving handouts it's the dependency on 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 welfare is a is a revolting thing we have the same thing with our, our religious populations too they're kind of lobbying the government all the time for for state handouts that's the stuff i dislike i dislike big government giving out money all the time it's just it never works it never it never incentivizes people to get off their backsides and and do and be whoever they they can be. Yeah, I, I, I see. That there's certain things which I'm fine with. Like, say for example, you know, temporary handouts. Like, see if the company you're working for goes yeah. up and you're you're out a job. No, and we've got great healthcare. We we've got a national health system that is actually competitive. We've got multiple providers. You can switch from one to the other. They're semi-state but semi-private. I sell used computers to them actually, and I know from behind the scenes that they're run reasonably efficiently, like reasonable companies, not like, you know, monolithic, ridiculous government entities. So so that kind of works. The health system works here. It's, and it's not paid for by bloody Americans, okay? So F you, Americans. You do not pay for our health care. You give us gift vouchers to spend at Northrop Grumman. That's what you give us. Four and a half billion dollars worth of, of defense contracting gift vouchers, which is massive, which is basically a massive subsidy against Airbus. So it's a massive fuck you to EU is that America gives all this money to Israel that we then have to go and spend at the at the at the defense contracting shop. And there's a big argument here. And I I subscribe to it that we should not take American government handouts and we should have built our own arms industry. We've got, we have built our own arms industry, but we'd be 10 times better at it if we hadn't taken so much American money and we built everything ourselves. We had a plan to build a, a jet fighter in the 70s called the Lavi, I think, and it was cancelled in favor of buying F 16s. And um, we really should have built our own fighter because we would have done a damn good job at it. But 
welfare recipient we chose to be a welfare recipient instead of independent and um i resent that that's uh, that's fucked on actually because that's what everyone always says that that's the biggest critique or israel always takes american money but i didn't i didn't know that israel have to then spend that money back to well, america 90 percent of the money that we get from america goes straight back to america and we just buy we we bought the f-35 which is a Probably we don't know. I don't know. Apparently it's working, but yeah, we spend. We we bought the F thirty five, and they just they give us the it's gift vouchers. It's gift vouchers to spend at their stores. It's it's. it's really- <laughs> <laughs> I'm I've nearly caught up on all these. Uh, Sudi off the cuff. Much love, Dank. You have some spicy boys flooding your Discord. Are we getting raided? That's <laughs> We've not, not had a raid in quite some time. Uh, absolute moron, uh, mad lads, Jolly Jane. I've not heard of her, but I'll look her up. Uh, Ivan Knight, my friend got his poster taken down at uni for being too offensive. It was a black guy with drugs because he's a rapper. Uh, dare me to put up revenge posters thinking your pug would be nice on the PC walls. Uh, I will not condone such behavior, I will disavow. <laughs> now, if you don't pay your fine, are they going to confiscate your pug and no, sell it on eBay? I couldn't believe that. <laughs> I honestly couldn't believe that. I thought I seen the story going around at first, and I was sort of thinking, right, is this one of those things that's just a rumor, and then it grows arms and legs, and then it goes haywire? Until I then seen it on the BBC, and I was like, holy shit, it's fucking real! They took the family <laughs> and sold it. That is, that's the Germans, though. You know, it's like that's <laughs> Germany. <laughs> The I just of kicking doors in and taking shit. Your daughter, how much for your daughter? <laughs> oh, <fuck it. laughs> uh, James Brain, Brian, I sent you a, a Twitter DM request about that dick guy from yesterday. They doxed the full address. Uh, I don't know what that's about. Yeah, I'm not going to discuss Tommy's address and uh, the house and all that stuff. All oh, oh, right, okay, fair enough. It's just know. not worth talking about. Did someone send you Polish PLN? What's that? I think that may be Polish money. I'm not sure. I don't, yeah. I'm not well versed on a currency codes. No, uh, grave should be a place where people learn sharpshooting and throwing tomatoes at him. Marks the great father of cucks. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Definitely from Poland. <laughs> um, <laughs> Marks fucked a lot of stuff up. I tell you, that was a disaster. That what that was. Oh uh, yeah, Marks. Marks wasn't the. Uh, the smartest of chaps. Well, uh, I think he's very smart. He just got everything wrong. But just, <laughs> it's like unbelievable. Um, Mega Killer X can't spell Ashkenazi without Nazi. Yeah, thanks. Well done. I've never <laughs> seen that before. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Mazin, I'm Israeli, living in Norway. Very interesting. Uh, Voodoo Media. I toured Norway in the summer. I, I went on a cruise around Norway. It was an unbelievable place. I've, I've had sure. loads of people tell me to go there. I've seen pictures of just the landscapes and stuff. Oh, on, we, we were on this cruise ship. It was the first time I've ever been on a cruise ship. And it wasn't a very big cruise ship. It was like three and a half thousand people. It wasn't like one of the massive ones. So we sail up this fjord and um, we get this, like the last place we get to is this, like the end of the fjord is basically, junk, and then we part the boat and we spent a day there. And then on the way back out, there's this waterfall on one side. And the captain of the boat says, oh, uh, ship, I says, I want to show everybody the waterfall that's on this one side of the ship. So hold my beer. So we're in a fjord. It's like 500 meters wide. And the ship's 300 meters long. And he just swivels. He just sits on the spot. And, <laughs> and it takes about three minutes. But he turns this 300 meter long ship. 360 degrees and then sails out the fjord. It was it was an incredible bit of seamanship. Obviously, it's very easy. They've got these thrusters and the yeah. The, but it's like what a piece of ballet. <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, with a hundred with a hundred meters clearance at the front and the back. It yeah, just, it's like a, it's like a very good three point ton. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Sketchy Meatball, how about Absolute Mad Lads Leo Major? I'll look him up as well. I do look up the Mad Lad recommendations, don't worry. Uh, YMGA, I'm Scottish. For any Americans, we all shag haggis. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan I Mad- thought you ate it. <laughs> oh, no, I love it. I eat it for breakfast every day. 
Jonathan Mazin, kind of weird to see my country's flag on Dank Stream. Uh, Siley, what's Brian's thoughts on the future of Europe? <laughs> oh God. I, okay, so a few years ago, if your audience do not know the name Bat Yaor, you should. Bat Yaor wrote a book called Eurabia. She wrote the book on Dimitri, which is the study of Christians and Jews living under Muslim lands. So I went to hear the first time I ever saw her or met her. Um, and she's the wife of this guy, actually, who got the award from Mossad for taking the Jews out of Morocco years ago. Um, she, she, she gave this talk at Chatham House. I think I'm allowed to talk about it, but it wasn't Chatham House rules. But she gave this talk. Uh, this was, I don't know, 2000 or something when Arabia came out and she gave this very depressing talk uh we're all fucked the, the, the islam is coming the the european leaders have sold you out in a euro arab dialogue and they've teamed up and it's nothing to do with jews it just that's what the leadership of europe has done in this globe this push for globalization and i i asked the question because i was like what shall i do and she said move to america that was what she told me. So I, I tried her advice, but didn't make it and wound up in Israel instead because I've got the escape here. But the only thing that I see for Europe is you if you like Brexit was a massive deal because Brexit showed that there is actually a willingness to fight this massive uh, empire. And this yeah. summer, when when there's a European Union elections all across Europe now, we won't see it in Britain because, you know, UKIP will cease to exist, uh, unfortunately, in the European Parliament. But I'm hoping that the European Parliament will show lots more of the, you know, like the Polish and the Hungarian and the, the, the Czech. All of these countries will send more nationalistic, M, you know, MEPs to Europe. And the European project will hopefully start to disintegrate. If that happens and you go back to a series of proud nations who are not disposed to fight aggressive wars of conquest against anybody then yeah. i think europe europe can can pull itself back but you've got to have babies and you've got to start repopulating your own countries with your own people rather than trying to import workers and if you do need to import workers go get some chinese or thais or 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 or, or anybody except hordes of muslims who will never adapt to your system and more than that Islam, the, the stronger Islam feels, the more it oppresses the Muslims who are already there, and then they fall into a line that you won't like. So even if they were heading towards a kind of Western um, Western assimilation or, or putting their, their religion to one side, if Islam becomes stronger, they're the first ones to be crushed by it. Depressing. But fight back. Brexit. Make sure it happens. We're, we're, we're fucking trying, man. <laughs> we're fucking trying. Like uh, basically, the, the establishment they don't want it to happen. They, no, they, they, they I, uh, I can happen. see. Yeah, they're trying everything that they can to prevent it. But we're almost at the end of the super chats. Yeah. Okay. I think, and I'm. It's past midnight here. Oh god, right. No worries. Um, the, the last one was uh. McDad from the country of 200,000 marching Nazis. That was a wonderful one to end on. <laughs> there we go. Um, well, in fact, sorry, a few more. Uh, mega killer, Israel is the Rhodesia of the Middle East. <laughs> um, I can say something really unpop. Well, I, listen, I, I actually have a lot of sympathy for white South Africans because I think they've created, white Africana South Africans created an indigenous identity that is real and exists only on that land in South Africa. It is not Dutch. They have created an identity over the last few hundred years that is real and they are being pushed off what should really be considered to be their land. There is plenty of space there and it is, it's absolutely brutal and terrible what's going on. Oh, yeah. what was where I was born. Um, yeah, I have some affinity for the place. Ah, fucking, it's, uh, it's fucking shit what's going on there. Like, I would see when I watched Southern's documentary, I was just, yeah. like, I knew, I knew it was bad. I didn't know 12-year-old no. children being boiled in a bathtub bad. Like, it, that's it's, fucking horrible. That listen, we've, we've got terrible cruelty and horror going on here. My friend was stabbed in the back while he spoke on the phone, 
a few months ago. Um, uh, and he was a big beefy army guy and he should never have been talking with his back turned where he was talking. But anyway, and he, he turned around, chased the guy, got off a shot and then dropped dead. Um, Jesus. Uh, and in fact, his daughter got married, I think the day before yesterday, but, uh, no. um, yeah, bad stuff happens. And, but yeah, South Africa is under, yeah, I, there's no, they don't, they could have, they didn't have to go that way, but, Mandela was a Mandela kept things in line, and as soon as he was gone and out of the way, I could tell it was going to go very bad. Yeah, fucking hell, man. But I think that's a good point to wrap up. Yeah, that was good, oh, man. I'll, I'll let I you love talking to you. <laughs> yeah, it was a good chat, man. But uh, I can see your eyes starting to go a little bit. <laughs> You're getting tired, yeah. <laughs> and I ran out of whiskey long ago. <laughs> But anyways, uh, it was a good talk, man. We should do this again. Yeah. All right. And, um, hello to the chat room. Thanks for being here. And um, I hope you weren't infected with too much dewy magic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good note to end on. All right. Thanks very much, guys. Good night. Shalom. Bye. <laughs>